Hello Absolutely. and welcome to another Live Quality Conversation on the Live Quality Podcast. And today I'm privileged to host Daniel. Daniel is uh, from the OG Rose channel, uh, but he's many things. He's a man of many talents. <laughs> he plays music. He's a parent. Uh, he's a philosopher. Uh, he is a tutor sometimes. He runs a business. and. Um, yeah, did I say YouTuber? Yeah, he's a YouTuber and an author. Uh, recently had a book come out, uh, Second Thoughts. Yeah. Um, so he's a man of many things. And I'm very privileged. I've learned so much from Daniel. Uh, he's a good friend. Uh, we've had many conversations before and hopefully many more in the future. Every time I speak with Daniel, I learn so much more. And it's, it, it, every conversation has been beautiful. I'm still sad we didn't record the very first one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, on our hearts. hello, Daniel. To hear yeah. on our hearts. <laughs> yeah, yes. I'll, 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 you know, I'll invite you to uh, join me and uh, let's see where this conversation goes. So if I was to ask you, how have you been and what's on your mind? And yeah, what would you say? As an excellent, excellent question, and indeed, the conversations have been a delight, and I'm I'm so glad to know you and to have had the chance to speak with you. You always manage to bring in exactly what needs to be said at the right moment, so that's a, a privilege to to know someone who's capable of that and who speaks so well. And uh, uh, you are a master of also imagery and bringing in the image that helps bring things together in a powerful way. Uh, the apathetic walking stick, uh, the ex just, it's just a marvelous, I use that all the time now. So it's just absolutely magnificent. Um, well, I have been saying, I am trying to get Belonging Again 2 together. Uh, so you mentioned we put out Second Thoughts recently, just kind of gathering assorted thoughts. And Belonging Again 2 is the address of the explanation of Belonging Again 1. And Belonging Again 1 is going to talk about Sort of like, why is it that people, you know, people talk about the meaning crisis, they talk about the meta crisis, they talk about collapsing birth rates, they talk about the loss of friendship, the loss of relationship. Well, why, why exactly is that? And why are these things happening? And, you know, I, I really like a lot of the sociologists like a Peter Berger, a Philip Brief and different people like that. And so the first book was trying to explain basically a way to sum it up is that we've lost givens, like reality is no longer given to us. Um, which in one way is outstanding. We're liberated. We're free to do whatever we want, to think however we want. But the problem is, uh, wherever there's choice, it's existential. It's difficult to decide and it's overwhelming and it's anxiety. So freedom creates anxiety. But of course, that means you can escape anxiety via oppression or being controlled or other problematic things like that. Well, that's not good. But then that would mean that you have to learn to be able to handle the loss of givens. Uh, in that anxiety space. Well, how in the world do you do that? What does that even mean? And how do you begin to work to a place where you can come to terms with that loss of givenness? Um, that's, uh, that's what the address is about. And one of the things that I've been, just been very interested in recently is how exactly the material world around us becomes married with an abstraction according to which it is intelligible to us. So a, a, a form of this, for example, would be, I say that bookshelf right there is worth $200. Well, where is $200 located in facticity? Where do you find $200, right? And yet $200 still is a kind of concrete reality. It's abstract and yet it's also concrete. That's what's weird. It's, um, you know, um, like someone like Marx will call it a fetish. He'll call it like it's a religion. It's like metaphysics. And yet it's also not purely abstract. So the bookcase right there is worth $200 or whatever it is. I'm just making up a number. And it would seem erroneous to say it's an illusion to be worth $200. That seems, like an, that seems wrong to say that's an illusion. But it also seems wrong to say that $200 is a fact the same way that this is hard or that this is a fact, right? So what is this middle space according to which society makes metaphysical dimensions intelligible? What are those? And how do you make new ones? Because that's what it all comes down to. Because the thing is, if I say, you know, if, I'm, if, if you're really asking the question, how do you get the majority of people to believe that that bookcase is worth $200 and that $200 is an abstraction that has an authority? It's kind of like pretty wild 
that people come to believe that and to organize their life around that. And in a way, that's oppressive because then everyone's living kind of according to a almost myth that this bookshelf is worth $200. And yet that also allows social intelligibility. I can now talk to people about that bookcase as being worth $200. And even whether they're Chinese, American, Catholic, Hindu, it doesn't matter. There's a kind of universal language in that, uh, that, in that abstract form, right? So if we want to talk about community, global community, global pluralism, we're going to have to somehow create a new abstract uh, social form like that. That isn't just money. Because the problem is you could argue that a big cause, and then I'll give it back to you, a big cause of the meaning crisis is that the only global language is money, right? Because money is a kind of language. And, now, and everyone feels kind of reduced by that. They feel reductionist. Or the other global language we tried to, to create was science. Glo you know, you use facts. Because those are, you know, uh, great. E equals MC squared, whether you're Hindu, Christian, you know, man, woman, it doesn't matter, right? Glo you know, scientific laws are also a universal language. Money and scientific laws, and I'll just stop on those two, are forms of a universal language that mod modernity generated to help us deal with problems of difference. But as we see, those lead to what? What Vivek calls the meaning crisis. So basically, if we're going to avoid the meaning crisis, and not end up in everyone just not talking to one another because we don't have a shared language and atomizing. We have to somehow think about a new abstract social form that is not reductionist, that allows people from different pluralistic backgrounds to relate to one another without reducing one another. But then at the same time, how do you even do that? What does it mean to have a universal language that is non-reductionist that is intelligible to all people of all difference so that the globe doesn't end up in, oh, World War III or tribalism or everyone, you know, Duganism, all of these different things pulling apart. Some candidates that come to mind are things like friendship, beauty. Beauty is an abstract social form that can be understood across difference. Lack, the apathetic center we were speaking with Guy about. So I've been thinking a lot about that particular problem on a new global abstract form that has a certain authority over people that, that makes difference intelligible, without which global pluralism seems impossible, at least not in a form that doesn't lead to everyone retreating or alienation or various forms like that. So as I go through the chaos of belonging again to, this is kind of, you could say, kind of the central consideration. Because again, if we got we got to kind of respect modernism in the sense that it found a universal language, facticity, science, money, it's just that there were unintended consequences of that. And now we're facing those unintended consequences. So we have to do something else, but then also keep our eye on the ball of what that something else looks like. And it's some abstract social form that is able to be a kind of universal language. But I give it back to you. Yeah, thanks for the thoughts. Well, there's a lot in there. And uh, a few things came up for me while you're sharing that. It's uh, it, it, the, the, the term was uh, obviousness. Um, and I, I think that's what you're calling the, the loss of the givens. Um, because, and I was having a chat with a friend over the weekend about this. It's like, for the longest time, uh, you know, humanity and, you know, all other forms of being were not challenged because uh, they were obvious. It's like, what does it mean to be human? It's, it's very obvious. You can just see it. We don't need to articulate this. We just be it. And, um, but with time, of course, uh, we've gotten so accustomed to it that now it has fallen to the background and we think we lost it. And so now we feel the need to justify it and bring it back and reassert it in, a, in such a strong way just just because we feel we've only discovered it, but it has always been there, right? And so you have all the different uh, identity, the rise of the identities, right? And and they are all sort of like a re-expression of our humanness that we think we lost, uh, that we don't want to be dismissed or that we don't want to lose, but yet, actually, we didn't lose. We always had it. 
And so you have you, you have varying categories of people. And I think this is where the, the meaning crisis starts to come in because um, these people who uh, are very aware about their humanness, if I may put it that way. It's like they, very, they know who they are, where they are, what is going on, um, how to show up in the different shared contexts. And this is not a problem for them. Like, like they, they don't need to defend who they are because they just they just are right. Like they 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 know it. They show up, and this is fine. Uh, however, you will see in other scenarios whereby you ask someone to introduce themselves, and then they introduce themselves to all these things that they participate in that they believe that they are, and kind of like what I was doing at the beginning, right? You know, you're this, you're that, you're that, you're that, but. But that list is endless. Like I could not exhaust it, and neither could you exhaust it if you had the chance, because that that set of things is ever ever shifting. It's it's always dynamic. It's always changing. And I think that that is where we now start to get to a place whereby how do we share the same space? That is the space itself is is shifting, right? <laughs> we are shifting, <laughs> and we spoke about this in the It's like all this this dynamism like it's like a whole chaotic you know ball mixing itself shining and turning and lots of things are happening in there and i think that earlier on like when we were let's say not too aware as a as a species this was okay like we were fine <laughs> uh, we, we, we were just humaning and getting along with our human problems and you'll see this a lot in uh like uh develop, developing societies like you know where it's like uh it's like a tribal society and the the most important thing is just finding a meal and having some water it's like when you when you're grounded to solve those problems and whereby the consequences of not solving those problems is like the end of life for you uh you quickly lose your existentialism right like existentialism is a privilege that you can only earn once <laughs> you have a stable safe environment to live in and you know you, you, you're not trying to survive it's like you have survived now you can you can try to be existential and wonder about the meaning of life and what you wish it could be how you want to express that meaning how you want to influence it uh and I think it's testament that we are we, we have the rise of the meaning crisis because then it means that the the world is a much safer place, it's a more stable place. Like we've solved some of the bigger problems uh, that now that we are now getting to these problems of uh, existentialism and trying to be on the same page. And then and and I think that's that's part of like you know that project you're talking about. How do we have that? Um, universal language that allows us to, you know, communicate our humanness without a need to uh, assert, you'd say, the static forms in which we experience it and dismiss uh, other people's expressions of it and sort of like, sort of like hold our space of being. Um, while we're being in it and and sort of like allow it to develop, develop and sort of like become uh, a deeper experience, draw us deeper into the mystery so that we can, you know, learn more from it, take more out of it. And uh, yeah, and, and, I'll, and I'll pass it uh, back to you. What, what do you make of some of those thoughts? Uh, you said a lot of uh, really important things. So first off, I think it is extremely important to emphasize the notion that there, the, the, the existence of the meaning crisis in some ways is actually a good thing. Um, there's a paper at the end of Belonging Again, part one, that's called The Meaning Crisis as a um, Sign of Hope. And the idea of it is like we have to realize that when we talk about the meaning crisis, a risk can be that metaphorically it sounds like we ran into a dead end. We were wandering around, we went through a door, suddenly the door slammed shut behind us and we looked and we're like, oh crap, we made a wrong turn and now we're doomed. Like, what are we going to do, right? It's important to realize that we actually do know how to get meaning. It's called xenophobia, nationalism, closed-mindedness, war, scapegoating. 
we actually do know how to give meaning. The issue is that many, many people today are choosing not to use those ways of getting meaning. And so the lack of meaning is actually evidence of a kind of ethical or moral or philosophical improvement. Now, there are a lot of people today who are going back to old ways of getting meaning, and that's a problem because they're going into, say, conspiracies. Conspiracies give you meaning, you know, othering war. Like they're going back to old ways to give meaning that require violence or immorality. But there are a lot of people who the people suffering the meaning crisis tend to be the people who are choosing not to use those old ways. So it's more like metaphorically, you have that image of um, Thomas More is the image I use from the movie A Man for All Seasons, who was executed because he refused to grant the, queen, the, the king a divorce uh, because Henry, I believe he wanted. So and Thomas More's like, I'm not going to do it because it goes against my beliefs. And he, uh, and he ended up getting executed for it. There's a nobility in that. Thomas More at any point could have left the prison simply by giving the king the divorce, but he refused. Does that mean that um, Thomas More did not know how to leave the prison? No, no, he knew. The fact that he didn't leave the prison was actually a testament to a certain sort of character, right? I think it's really important to see the meaning crisis that way because it gives you kind of hope for the moment. It gives you inspiration to think it through. And metaphorically, you don't think about the meaning crisis as evidence that mankind did something really stupid. Because that's right now how people think about it. Oh, we made a big mistake. We don't know how to get out of this. Oh, we're so dumb. I guess we're doomed now. No, you need to see, I think it needs to be seen as more like a Thomas More thing, which is for Thomas More, another way to look at it, you are holding out until you can find a better alternative, until you can find a way to give meaning that is not falling back on old ways. Um, because, you know, if Thomas More could have, say, for example, found an interpretation of the Bible and Christianity that would have led him to conclude that it was possible to, say, grant the divorce without betraying his values, then he could have done so and not, say, had bad character, right? So likewise, if we can find meaning today without, say, going back to old ways of finding meaning, well, that's perfectly fine. But in that way, the meaning crisis then is a testament to some sort of improvement. And I think that's really important because if you lose that, you may give up the improvement and go back to old ways that then cause a collapse of who knows what, uh, all sorts of problems. And so I think that's really important that what you were pointing out. I think also another way to look at it is as you move from poverty to kind of wealth or as you move to more technological advancement, it will no longer do, it will no longer suffice to simply try to determine right and wrong according to law. You know, what is illegal and what is, um, you know, it's illegal to murder. Okay, but what choices should I make? You see, this is the issue. As you gain freedom, as you gain technological possibility, you gain what? Choice. Law does not help you make decisions. Law simply provides the framework in which decisions are made, right? So here's the problem. As you move into increasing freedom, if you will, or potential, um, then you also get more choice. But choice is terrifying. And choice is anxiety producing. And so people then turn to find a metric by which to make choice that can be existentially stabilizing, and all they find is law, or somebody says, well, do what you want to do. That's not nearly enough, because why do I want to do X and not Y? What, what does that say that I am? Ah, and then, pe and then eventually people don't want to make a choice at all because it's too burdensome to make choice, and then everything feels meaningless because they can't choose anything, and what they do choose makes them feel anxious, and there's a kind of meaninglessness that comes to all possibilities, a certain weight that comes. I think basically, to, to say a bunch of really general things, what you see today is when you're dealing with very obvious problems, like running water, food, health, utilitarianism as a moral philosophy gets you pretty far. Because it's pretty obvious to say that what we need to do is to increase, say, food supply. Okay, that's great. But as you move to choice, you find yourself actually having to move into something more like value or virtue ethics that an Aristotle is going to talk about. Well, we basically spent the last hundred years saying virtue ethics are stupid, that value ethics are dumb, and we really don't need that. All we need is algorithms for utilitarianism, um, increasing the greatest good. You know, the new movement now and out of Oxford is long termism, which is a very algorithmic. How do we increase happiness? You know, how do we increase well-being around the world using these algorithms? 
et cetera, and so forth, you know, effective altruism, so on and so forth. No, I'm not here to throw shade on those because all of those have a role. The problem, the, usually the biggest problems with human beings is not that they're entirely right or entirely wrong, but that there's overfitting or underfitting. Utilitarianism or effective altruism in terms of problems of basic facticity, running water, health, givenness, is very effective. The problem is when you overfit that moral philosophy and act like it will also help you with choice, basic individual choice on what you're going to do with your time, what you're going to do in your marriage, what you're going to do in relationships, stuff like that. Effective altruism can't help you make choice, but you still have to choose. Well, how in the world do I make choice then? Oh, well, you'll figure it out. No, no, you will not. Uh, you, you will not if you don't have a lot of training or you have any community or institutions to go to. And, and those aren't provided because actually people are like, well, if you provide those, aren't those kind of oppressive? Because you're like almost forcing people to live or to make choices one way versus another. So we don't provide those. But that means everyone is left alone on their own to decide their standard of choice making. And how do you even start? Because how do you even choose your standard of choice making? And where do you even get that? And how do you choose X instead of Y? Ah, so then if it's, it's all meaningless then because I can't decide anything. And so there's, so there's a chaos. So a lot of what's happening, in my opinion, is an overfitting of moral philosophies because it must be understood that if, if there, where there's increasing choice, there's a need for increasing ethics. Ethics is not merely law. That's one form of ethics. But there's also ethics that is individual valuation and what you think is good and therefore you choose. That's another side of the ethical equation. Well, that's more of Aristotle. We don't teach Aristotle. We don't even know what that guy's talking about. And so we're confused. And the last way I'll describe this is that the movement in the Paradiso of Dante, when you're in Inferno, it's sin, not sin. Good, bad. You send your here. But as you move to the pet, and this is very, there was a presentation we did on it at Philosophy Portal with the Lacan Conference. But as you go to heaven, Beatrice, it's all about timing. She says to Dante, if I smile too soon, it will kill you. You have to ascend slowly to be able to handle more and more grace and possibility and meaning and motivation. You have to develop character to handle more righteousness. And if you get it too soon, it will destroy you. Well, that's, that's not just law then. That's not just utilitarianism. That's an art form. That's a gradual process of developing to handle more and more freedom, more and more possibility. We do not as a society have a Beatrice model. We as a society do not have a virtue or value ethics model. We have utilitarianism or sin or not sin, inferno, that we are overfitting in more prosperous nations and, and acting as if that will give people what they need to make individual choices when it will not, then people's alone, they don't know what to turn to, and they become, they become hopeless. They become atomized, or they turn back to closed-mindedness, because it, when I didn't think about things, then I knew what to do. Like, when I, was just, when I just was dogmatic, then I had direction, so I don't want to think about anything. But in order to stay closed-minded, you have to avoid the other. You have to avoid diversity. Because diversity, by definition, makes you realize that it could be other, and that destabilizes your dogma, Right? So then you start moving away and everyone tribalizes again. So we do not as a, so I'll get, there's more to be said because another thing that comes up is like you were talking about the list and saying everything you could go on forever. There's something today where when you look at like, well, let's take Tolkien. Everyone loves Tolkien. Yeah. You know, Lord of the Rings. What does everyone do when you meet a character in Tolkien? They tell you their story. I'm Vamir, son of, I come from Rivendell. They give you a story, right? We're probably entering in an age where you almost have to return to something like that. Where when people meet one another, they give you their story. Because when I give you my story or my lineage or my family, I'm telling you my position. Now you know where I stand in reality and you can talk to me uh, because, I can, because, I'm dealing, because I don't know what tribe you come from. I don't know. So this is my story. And also there's some sort of skill that's going to be needed. It's almost like an ability to actively make intelligible something you have never encountered before while you're meeting it. There's no, like, you have to have that ability actively, which is more philosophical. So there's, so there's something, so I said a lot, I'll give it back to you. There's something probably about the return of story for introduction that has to happen. The ability to apprehend something you've never encountered before actively in the encounter to make it intelligible so you can relate to it. Um, and then three, there has to be an understanding that what is needed today 
is abilities to say, do like virtue ethics, value ethics, there are different terms for it, Beatrice, and the ability to have standards for decision making in a manner that also is aware of difference so that you don't alienate difference, but stay open to the other so that you can have relationships. So I give it back to you. Wow. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Uh, <clears throat> and it's, it's interesting. Uh, you, you, t you touch about that, you know, unpacking the intelligibility in something that you're experiencing and still unpacking, right? It's like yeah. you, you're encountering chaos and uh, wrestling with it as it reveals itself to you. Um, you know, I, with this podcast, I'm, I'm learning so many things. Uh, I've had to articulate certain things that I didn't know that uh, I would have to, right? Oh, sure. uh, I, I, I invite a few guests and um, or share a video that, you know, we recorded a conversation I started to publish uh, last week. And there's been some interesting feedback. Why don't you define the topic and subject articulately at the beginning uh, of the conversation so we can know what it's about? And, um, and I'm explaining, look, I also don't know what it's about, right? <laughs> when I'm getting in the conversation, I don't know. I, I just know there's a person before me and we're going to try and have a great conversation. And so that's what I'm trying to do during, during the conversation. And retrospectively, like I will go and, you know, because I, I have to edit it, like I, I will go and listen through it. And then I will realize what the conversation was about and what themes emerged. And then I will name, <laughs> I will name it, but I can only do that in retrospect after I've had that experience. I, it's not possible for me to do it ahead of time. And I've found that the times when I have tried to do that, I sort of like, I freeze it, and then I can't really enjoy the experience because I'm trying to limit where it goes. Uh, it's like, it's only gonna be about this topic and we have to keep coming to it. And if you talk about the same thing about five times, it quickly fizzles out, like it quickly fizzles out its life. And then, cause, cause you know, our minds don't work that way. This is why things like we, we have classes for meditation, right? Like they're trying to teach you how to keep your mind in the same place. And it's incredibly hard because the mind doesn't want to stay in the same place. It, it has places to be. It's, it's always making associations. It's always relating to what could be, what has been, and, you know, how is it all fitting in this current reality that we're experiencing? And, and I think that is a vital feature. Like, it's a feature. It's not a defect. Like, we shouldn't be trying to fix that. We should be learning to work with it. And I think as part of uh, trying to find a universal way, like a universal language, we're going to need to cultivate that, to cultivate that capability of, of you know, being able to work with what's coming at us as it comes at us, as we figure it out, you know, it's like we solve it as we're figuring it out. Uh, the, and that is going to require us to, you know, have an understanding of, of you know, the ethics. And, and I, I joke about this. Uh, I, I, I ask people, it's like, you know, how Jesus went and sat at the right hand of the Father? Yeah. Does the father have a left hand? <laughs> what happens there, right? And it's a, it's a funny question because, you know, growing up, I always assumed like, you know, God's sitting there, there's the right side, there's the left side, you just go sit on the right side and you're all good. And we don't really care about what happens on the left side. But eventually it turns out the right side is really about the righteousness, like knowing what right is and being in continuous relationship with right and so it's like you have a sensitivity for what is right for your being right you, you do have that inbuilt ability to sense that and the the whole righteousness is calling you to know where the right spot to be in the reality, in the right reality, and engage with it to maintain the right relationship with it so that things 
are not working uh, beyond where the, you're not being stretched kind of like the, the, the visual. So you're not being given more than you can handle and you're not, you don't have less than you need. And so it's like the right balance. And in the, in the, it, when I think like when we learn to uh, inhabit that spot more, then things like the choice pattern starts to become obvious once again it's like because it's it's aligned with the with the feeling of right of the righteousness but of course you, we have to be wary and i think this is where the crisis comes in because uh we've been wrong about many things right and we know that and we get things wrong a lot so we we start to lose confidence in ourselves in being able to sense right and i think that is that's what leaves us stuck and, and frozen and worried because I, I could do that, but, you know, what if I don't get it right? And I think not getting it right should be an answer to what right is. It's like, I tried to walk through a door. I did not succeed. So the right thing is not to walk through the door. But I think we get hung up on, <laughs> hung up on how could I not succeed, right? The, the moral aspects. It's, it, it, I should have succeeded. You know, the ego comes and is like, I, I, I should have, I should be the one with the ability to walk through the door without opening it. And you quickly find that, no, it doesn't, doors don't work that way and your body doesn't work that way. And when there's that disagreement, the result is a pain and it's an ever increasing pain. However much, <laughs> with, with much intensity, you, you try to attempt this, the pain will always increase. And it's just saying, uh, right is different from this, right? Mm. <laughs> but but it's right there. It's like it's yeah. right there before us. And I think we're losing the sensitivity for that, and uh, and sort of like thinking about it morally, cognitively. It's like we just want we 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 miss the given. We we miss the givens, and so we're going like, oh, I just wish. It was always like this, and I always knew it was just a couple of options, and they already told me what that is, and so I can I can just live within that limited domain. But the problem is then you cannot become uh, more of of uh, what you need to become. You cannot you're just sort of like stuck, right? You're stuck in 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 a in a moment in time and experience, and and so you can't move up closer to the to be stressed right and you can't you can't go back down because then and, and probably the thing that's coming behind you will grab you at some point if you're stuck in the same spot too long um but yeah i've, I've said quite a bunch of things i'll pass it back to you no it's excellent um i think i think on the idea where you were talking about people want to know the topic of a conversation before they step into it that would speak to the sociological character of most of human civilization. You know, what is the topic? What is the intelligibility? Is it Christian? Is it, is it Hindu? Is it, you know, what, what is it? Then there's a way of, oh, I walk in. Oh, okay. This is, um, this is a Protestant town. Oh, okay. This is a artist community. Okay. I know the topic before I'm there. Right. And so basically the, the issue is that in these kind of uh, conversations that, that we're having, there is a certain modeling of, in the very dialogue of the sociological circumstance of global pluralism, where people do not know the topic, uh, you go in and find out. Like, you know, Jordan Peterson talks a lot about chaos versus order, right? What we're seeing today is actually what global pluralism requires is some sort of capacity to make order in the encounter of chaos. It's not a, we need to balance chaos and order. Not that Peterson is saying that, but a lot of people, this kind of idea that you need some order and you need some chaos. Okay, I don't necessarily deny that, but there's actually some sort of ability to order chaos, in, to make chaos intelligible. And then it's as if it was never chaos, actually. Uh, it was always just various notes that were coming together to make a harmony in music, right? So in the same way that if for most of human history, what you've had is creating social societies are formed according to an abstract social form. You know, that's kind of like there's a form. What we're seeing now is seemingly the need for almost an abstract social art or ability. Like you were saying, the ability itself. And I think that's, that's getting added is in a global pluralistic age, the address is not a form, but a certain shared capacity. 
which because if everyone you ran into, regardless of their backgrounds or diversity, were capable of um, finding order in chaos or entering into a relationship, not needing to know ahead of time what was about, but they were able to apprehend what it was about in the experience of it, that right there would be an abstract social art that would allow community across difference without the smothering of the difference or the need for people to know the topic ahead of time. Or are we capitalists? Are we communists? Are we whatever? Well, let's go in and find out, right? That is, I think, getting at what exactly is needed for the quote unquote meaning crisis. Because another way to kind of put at it is in utilitarianism, I don't, th there is an abstract social form, reduce pain. There's no art. It's very given. Just do this thing, formulate a society accordingly, right? Follow the law. Okay, got it. What, and, and what actually ends up happening is once you start moving to virtue ethics, well, there's more like an, an art form, a kind of act, an ability to read the room, to read the conversation, and then follow it, not knowing where it's going to go, but you're able to follow where it goes. It's like you were saying with Guy the other day, like the, um, the way you need to go is found in the chase. Just follow the thing, and then that's the way you need to go, right? That's pointing at what an abstract social art would look like that would make possible a global pluralism that doesn't fall into the horror of anxiety. But then I think that would require an education school system that is teaching people that that is what it means to be educated. Right now, we, this is the problem. People believe you are educated if you know the topic. An educated person knows the topic. An educated person knows the facts. An educated person has memorized what's going to be said. They know the script. Most of education today is, as I talk about with Neil Postman, is a trivia structure. It is about knowing ahead of time what's going to happen. It's about having order, and then it occurs. It's about, it's actually an intelligent person is, a, is able to keep the conversation in, in, in binds. Like, an intelligent person can stay on topic, Right. Well, that means intelligence is precisely that which makes impossible global pluralism. Like an intelligent person is precisely someone who's not able to engage in an abstract social art, but someone who requires an abstract social form, by definition, that means you can't handle the other, like the true other. That means you can't handle difference. So we literally, and the key to education is not to merely think about it in terms of subjects. This is, you know, the Marshall McLuhan idea that the medium is the message. Like the material that you get from the TV, in it, the information being from the TV changes how you experience the information, regardless of the show. He was more interested in the medium of information, like a William Ong writing versus TV. Like the same information from a book will be experienced by your brain differently than if you get that same information from a television or from YouTube or from Instagram. That the medium is the message is his idea, because every medium suggest certain values in the very medium. So for example, from TV, it says that learning is inactive. It's passive. You turn off your brain and you receive. That's what it means to be educated. But in a book, educated means to be actively reading the words. You have to be very on. You know, um, I think he called books a hot medium because your brain has to be very active. Where with a TV, I think he called it a cold medium because it's very cold, right? So the mediums bring with them various associations. The current classroom associates education with trivia and knowing the topics. And so that's the value system that people bring forth, right? Regardless what they teach in the classroom, the medium of the classroom creates certain associations of what it means to be intelligent versus not. We are literally making people associate intelligence with exactly the opposite of what is needed to do with the reality of global pluralism. It's a wonderful mixture. Uh, because what you need is the ability to find the topic in. Emergency, you know, there's a lot of talk about the emergence, right? The ability to handle emergent, you know, Metamod, Brendan, you know, there's this idea. Yeah, that's right. But the ability to apprehend emergence and to be the conditions of emergence and it to be intelligible to you is an abstract social art or act. That is what needs to be trained in people today so they can, in so they can encounter the other and not be existentially destabilized. So they can encounter choice and not be existentially destabilized. Because here's the reason why, one of the reasons, and I'll give it back to you. Um, one of the reasons choice overwhelms people is because it feels so final. It feels so like, oh my gosh, I need to know everything before I make a choice. I need to know the topic. I need to know all the consequences. I need to know everything. If you instead knew 
or believed in your capacity to make it work, regardless what you do, you know, whatever choice I make, I'm going to make it work. Wherever the conversation goes, I'm going to make it happen. No matter who I run into, I'm going to make it intelligible. If you had that kind of confidence, dare I say, then choice would not feel so apocalyptic, so like overwhelming because it's like, well, we're going to make it work. Yeah, I choose this because I could choose X or Y, but regardless what happens, I'm ready for it. Now, that doesn't mean choice is arbitrary, but it means you're anti-fragile, as Nassim Tlaib talks about. You're able to make choice and then not feel so overwhelming because you have the capacity to find the topic in the choice, not know it ahead of time. So these things are all connected. And the very fact that we've just kind of been trained to associate education with staying on topic versus finding the topic you know, chasing something, like like knowing where you're going versus finding the way in the chase, these all contribute to our inability to um, to locate an abstract social art, which then my main point is the, dealing with the meaning crisis requires this abstract social art, I think. Like the problem is there is no abstract social form that will deal with the meaning crisis. It has to be an abstract social art that's going to deal with the meaning crisis. Now, everyone from their position will have their own unique form, Christianity, atheism, whatever, but the, the meaning crisis is a result of the between space of worldviews. Like, not in a worldview. We see lots of people who are still in a worldview who don't interact with difference, who have plenty of meaning because they close themselves off from the things that destabilize their source of meaning. No, the meaning crisis is what occurs to people between worldviews. Because that's the place of destabilization where then it feels all arbitrary. And to deal with the between space, that's where you need the abstract social art. That's where you need my friend Bernard Hankins. We've got, he's called like cipher mentality, like a hip hop cipher where people can make it happen. And just come. It's like a cipher mentality. You're able to just make the cipher work. You're able to improvise the dancer. These are the things that I think are needed today. And I would also point out, and then I'll give it before going into it, I think when you start talking about the movement from the Father to Jesus to the Holy Spirit in Christianity, once you get to Paul, it's basically like, okay, we have to think live active situations that we didn't know we were going to encounter ahead of time in light of the Holy Spirit, in light of the person of Jesus. So there's actually a movement, I think, in Christian theology that actually is kind of moving, dare I say, toward a, um, a cipher mentality, a kind of abstract social art. That, um, that is brought out in what I would call the situational reasoning of Paul, but that's a different topic. We are happy to go into that. But I think there's an abstract social art here that becomes primary. Yes, and uh, and yeah, the between space is, you know, really stands out for me because um, you, you, you notice this, like even, you know, your parent ra raising children, uh, especially if you have more than one, uh, you're always encountering that between space and having to manage it. And funny enough, like if you had to teach anyone anything, you quickly realize that giving them the proposition of what it is is highly insufficient. Like it doesn't matter how much I articulate and describe something to you. Um, if you do not, uh, you know, embody it in some way. Yeah, good luck. It's it's. It's, it's just not going to happen. Um, I've been trying to teach my son how to tie shoelaces, and we've made progress. He can tie shoelaces now, but then he's asking, what about all these other ways I can tie shoelaces? And so I was telling you, well, look, it's a, it's a never-ending lesson. Like you, I've, I've taught you enough, uh, but you're going to have to discover the rest on your own because now, now you have something uh, that can you can continue using in that in that in that domain of shoeless tying um but yeah and and i think <clears throat> to be able to do that you do need that self belief um and and most of the time uh people undermine uh the evidence that allows them to actually even be in a position where they can ask the question right it's like if, if, if you're in a position where you can ask the question, then definitely there's a lot of uh, evidence uh, that you have succeeded to that level, right? Uh, but it's, it's the, the whole absolutism, right? The, that thinking of like, it's, it's got to be fixed. It has to be finite. It's, it, it definitely has to be just this one thing. And 
and usually when we we do that we 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 box ourselves in and then it's re- it, it, we lose sight like what is that phrase blind sight we now get blind sight and 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 that's not helpful at all it it, it sort of like diminishes our ability to improvise and for the for the ability to improvise we really definitely need our mind wandering which is uh you know going back to that meditation thing it's like the goal is not to stop your mind from you know producing thoughts or having an experience no it's really more about observing how it does that and accepting this it's like so 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 going to the um to the universal uh solution for this like developing that language that abstraction space we sort of have to cultivate patience in this way whereby we allow we allow for the we allow for it to play out because we're quick sometimes to cut it off uh like what is the topic going to be it's like well how about we just wait you know a few minutes and see what it what the topic becomes right like let's hold the space let's allow for it to unfold uh i mean that requires us to slow down right and and everything is speeding up and everything is faster and so this is sort of like anti the current modern culture but i think it calls for that because it's in the slowing down that you actually start to see the detail otherwise you're moving too fast through time and space that the, the things the details that you need to probably be paying attention to are starting to become blurry around you and they don't seem like they're there but they are there the evidence is there and we can actually continually build that uh confidence and that muscle to be able to take more out of the mystery like to follow the chase and like really you know just focus on the chase what, what is it in harry potter like to be the one who catches the snitch just follow the snitch stay as close as possible to it and eventually the moment will reveal itself to you and you and you get it uh but but you have to endure that uh moment of waiting and following and taking in all the details and people will say this is really hard um and yes it can be hard and it is challenging but that's partly because it's a transformative experience right like you're not a soft person right? <laughs> if you if you if if you are you know that is a malleable would you be able to hold the space that you hold and so it's not so easy for you to be shifted and transformed so i think uh we have to be respectful to that and know that it's going to take some effort and it's going to take some uh patience like we really need to lean on the virtues right and and do the work and and hopefully the more we do that then we start to appreciate and be respectful of that between space uh or the we space right like how do we get in like even right now like this thing that we're doing whereby we i uh, you know you're listening i'm speaking and then i'm going to pass it back to you and then i'll listen it's it's more just to allow and and it doesn't mean that i'm going to get it perfectly whatever you say right uh but i'll get some of it if i listen right <laughs> and and if i allow you to speak uh you know probably you get to the point and 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 then i'll get it too like we will both discover it as we do this thing um but that is uh i think that's what we're being called to like that is one of the important things that we have to work on and cultivate so uh, i'll pass it back to you well i think that was all excellent and i think it highlights um it highlights how the character of social relations today if we're talking if we're specifically talking about the question of global pluralism which for me is major because i believe that basically all of the chaos in politics economics global like all of these things are tied to the inability to deal with the reality of global pluralism according to something that doesn't fall back on um old models of dealing with that which 
well, ultimately requires world war, I hate to say, and military and violence and segregate, you know, all of these kind of breakdown of trade, you know, a lot of different problems arise, uh, which would be a different topic. But I think we see that we see a certain uh, global political regression occurring in Hegel in Hegel. If you don't undergo the negation suppletion, what it is called for, you fall back. And the problem is when you fall back, you don't fall back in the same way. You fall back with greater consequence because you sh in the same. It's kind of very similar, you could say, in Christianity, which is for us, you know, you could say when a saint sins, a demon is born, you know, a, for a saint to sin is very different for just an, an average person to sin, right? So like the more you progress in history, this is like, you know, Hegel is often seen as like, oh, he's progressive. History has a march of progress. And yeah, that's all there. But there's absolutely the possibility of regression. The problem is when you regress because you've progressed, the consequences are much more dire. So it is very important to get it right. Uh, because if you don't and you regress, the consequences can be, can be large. Um, now, so what, what we see is, so to me, what, what is all being suggested is that the quality of global pluralistic relationships take on the quality of the artistic act versus the business exchange. And this is very important because most exchanges, most social exchanges are according to the mode of exchange of business, the commodity, like even like exchanging information. So what did you do today? Oh, I did X, Y, and Z. I'm trading. It's a trade right? Like I'm trading with you information. And I'm thinking Koratani where, you know, modes of exchange. And really you could say that human social relations take to tend to, will take on the form of some mode of exchange. And right now, most human, most human exchanges under modernity and post-modernity have taken on the character of um, trade business, you know? So what's the topic? You know, what is the product? What are we going to do? You know, what did you do? Today? I'm trading with you. I'm determining the product. I'm determining the value ahead of time. It's very kind of preset. And education reflects the industrial revolution still. The classroom is about making workers and different things, right? What, what, is, what is the character, though, of the artist? The artist is working on a novel for a long time, and people are like, so what are you doing? Uh, I, have to, I don't really know, but I have to keep working, and something's going to come of it, right? You have the artist in the studio. And you're like, that guy's crazy. Yeah, it, it has to be, though. Like, the artistic act is like you're training, you're reading books, you're getting better at your skills. The artist is also very pluralistic and diverse. They're gathering experiences, they're reading all sorts of things. And then one day, mysteriously, bam, they have their vision. They have their book. They have their comedia. They have their vision. And then it's, and then it's like a line is drawn through all the random things that seem to have nothing to go with it. And then it's all, oh, of course, that was what it was all going to add up to. Of course, that was going to be the topic, right? The, we'll talk about the phenomenology of the artist a lot. And really what's happening is we're seeing like a conversation like this is a social relation that is more like the phenomenology of the artist versus the phenomenology of the businessman. Because when you look for the topic by phenomenology, I mean the experience of the conversation is more of the artist or the business people. But another critical component of phenomenology is the, the study of phenomenology is to ask, what were the conditions necessary for this kind of experience? So it's not merely the experience, you're also asking about the conditions of possibility. So how do you undergo the experience of the creative act? Well, you have to do what an artist does. You have to expose yourself to a lot of different things. You have to develop a skill every single day, maybe for decades, and also in, encounter diversity and difference in pluralism, and also face your fears, and also take risks of never making money, developing courage, and do something that people think is strange, right? Mm -hmm. Those are all the things that the artist generally undergoes, right? That's the experience. And then the conditions of possibility for them to do that is they have some sort of drive, they have some sort of vision, they have some sort of way of apprehending reality that makes them capable of doing this. If indeed global pluralism today requires some abstract social act, and that abstract social act has the phenomenology of the artist, then what is required of global pluralistic social relations is that they have the quality of the artist more than the business person, of being able to throw yourself into something with skill and ability and then work with it until something emerges. What this would mean 
is that one of the reasons global pluralism has basically failed is because people have gone into conversations or communities with the phenomenology of the businessman. So they look for the topic ahead of time. Well, who gets to choose the topic? Well, then they're, in, they're forcing everyone to conform to that topic. And there are a lot of people who don't see the world that way or who disagree or who don't like the topic. Well, okay, well, this week we'll do John and it will be Christianity. Next week it will be Bob and atheism. And the next week after that, it will be business. Well, no, it's alien. Then, then that basically means that every week, 90% of people in the community will be alienated. It's just, but it's a fair alienation because we trade it off every week. That's not going to work. Um, because what will happen is no one will directly say, I don't want to be here. They'll just start missing meetings. <laughs> They'll just be like, oh, I was busy. I really wanted to be there. That's, that's basically how it always goes. When, when you don't bring into global pluralism the right phenomenology, then people drift. They drift away. They just stop going. And then it fails. It's not that anyone ever directly says it fails. They mostly say, oh, it was a great initiative. I'm so glad we tried. But it doesn't work because you're misfitting the kind of experience that people need. But the issue is, again, if you went to school and being an artist was stupid or wasting your, or impractical, then that literally means we have defined a practical, intelligent person as someone who is able to create the conditions of the phenomenology of the business transaction not the phenomenology of the artist. So no wonder global pluralism has failed or it's been reductionist or it's been meaningless, meaning crisis. There is no, there is, what, what, what is one of the main reasons the artist does what they do? They'll talk about meaning. It's meaningful to them because there's something about that miraculous moment where the order is there in the chaos as if it was always there when the topic emerges in the conversation that shows you reality is a place where that kind of thing can occur. Reality is suddenly a place where emergence is possible per se. Well, now all of reality changes in its character. If, it, if this kind of emergence is possible in a conversation, maybe it's possible on a walk. Maybe it's possible in the community. Maybe it's possible everywhere. And so the conditions of possibility for all of reality shift, and now it can regain a kind of enchantment, as Charles Taylor talks about. It can regain a kind of meaning. But a lot of this, for this to be, and then I give it back to you, for this to be something that the majority of people experience and thus ask, how is it possible? And then the conditions of possibility shift of all of reality, there has to be the awareness of the kind of experience that they're looking for. Most people, when they go into a conversation that doesn't have a preset topic, they do what? They say, oh, that conversation is, isn't about anything. It's a waste of time. It is impractical. So they have a value system that's overfit utilitarianism that doesn't allow them to enter into the space in which they can have the experience that changes the conditions of possibility of their life to make it more meaningful. And they're practical. And they're ethical to do this. They're ethical to close themselves off from these kind of experiences because they're using their time efficiently. They're being straightforward, right? And so that's where you create an ethics um, to do the right thing that keeps you from entering into the experience of Beatrice or moving into the virtue ethics. And so I, I think the consequences are quite dire to not to overfit the wrong mode of experience. Uh, because if you do that, then when you experience the right mode of experience, which is more artistic or emergent or dialogos, et cetera, you will literally in your brain go, that's not how it's supposed to go. And therefore, the proper address to our problems, you will identify with a mistake. And then when you avoid said mistake, you'll be in the right. And actually, you'll be in the wrong, but you won't have the capacity to know that you're in the wrong. And that's, that's quite a dire situation, I think. Wow. You know, something just popped up as you're describing that. Uh, a couple of things I was reminded of. Uh, Timos as uh, Aspasia. Who would <laughs> Would would say. <laughs> Thank you, Aspasia. Uh, well done. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's becoming a phenomenon now. Um, but yeah, it's like the the the, the idea came that <clears throat> it's as if we have the a spiritual um, immunity. Mm. You know, like we have a, a, a spiritual immune system in that it's trying to maintain us in a comfort spot. Right, it's like 
come on, you know what works. Uh, just, just stay there. Which reminds me now, what is it? Uh, which I was listening to recently, um, the Paradise Lost, right? Uh, mm. jo- yeah, yeah, John yeah. Milton. Uh, when the, I think in book one, when they're inviting all these demons to <coughs> make a case of what should happen, and one of them, I don't remember which particular one, is explaining. Look, um, maybe we just need to do our time out here in hell and maybe the one who banished us will see that we've we've done it diligently and then they'll invite us back to paradise and and i think we fall in that trap sometimes because it's like yeah look it's it's stable i know it's not great it's not great but it's it's not it's not the worst so i could just just stay right here and this should be fine it's like and then you 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 do it for a long time that I think the time is complacency. You become complacent such that now you cultivate this spirit that fends off any uh, opportunity to to wander and become curious about about you know emergence and and slowly we 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 stick to just doing what we've always done. And I think part of uh you you'd say the thing that led to people to, you know, leave, uh, get out of religious life <clears throat> is partly that. It's like, it's, it's, it's the same, right? It's the same again and again. And probably the, the, the leaders were not trying to extend it to uh, modernize it or bring it closer to the times and how the times are shifting. And so it started to become a bit static. And so then you had this, you know, <laughs> conflict. It's like, well, I, I can't go. It's, it's more of the same. I can't go to this week because it's more of the same that happened last week and the other week, and it doesn't really change. So it's it's static, like it's it's boring, it's old. We should just throw that out and go do something else, right? And the guys in the monastery are saying, "No, it's not. It's ever changing. Can't you see? It's so beautiful." But they can't articulate. They can't bring it to the level that the people who are not close enough can see. And so they're not telling them what to see. And so it starts to, like the, the, the margin just grows wider and wider. But then uh, I, I like the uh, what Vaviki talks about, the nuns, right? It's like spiritual, but not religious. It's like all of a sudden, it's like now people are realizing, oh, we couldn't uninstall the spirituality software. So it's, it's still running and we still, it, it gets us. Uh, as Jonathan Pajou would say, like it, it gets you whether you you channel it or not, it it's it's there. And so all of this makes us sensitive to the quality of uh, you know phenomenology. And so you 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 said when we become sensitive to that, and uh, the, we start to notice the quality, the the low quality of it, and and then we're in a dilemma, right? When we are in that um dilemma whereby we have to either accept the low quality <laughs> or do something about it and doing something about it is going to be effortful is going to require us to break our models is going to require us to uh learn a different mode of exchange like at at a spiritual level almost because like you know in 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 everyday things like you know I describe it like a friend asks me uh what is the one thing I need to do to have a successful romantic relationship? And I'm going like, it's, it's not, it's not, that, that's not the correct question you need to ask because think about it, right? Like what is the one thing you do when you're riding a bike or driving a car? It's like, there is no one thing. It's a whole bucket of things. It's like, you got to do all these things. You have quotes, balance, take several actions. And so you get your whole, nervous system uh you know working like in in this extended way um and and of course we get a bit anxious about it but actually it's like that is the level at which you need to be operating because you have all that potential you have all that capability uh i like to use the example of uh racing cars right like uh uh if you took a racing car and you put it on a normal road at, at you know with a speed limit of 60 it will really struggle 
and it may it may not do it for long because mm. that is not the speed at which it's designed yeah. to go right mm. uh it needs it needs a much higher speed it has a very higher speed limit mm. that it needs to mm. be allowed to raise to so that it can work optimally and if it's not if it's not allowed to go to that level then it it's sort of like dials down and starts to die in many different ways and 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 it's not because it's it, it, it's terrible or anything it's just it hasn't been allowed to flourish right and i think this is the same thing that's uh, part of the the crisis thing because you know you spoke about pursuing art as a, as a way of dealing with the the global pluralization and i'm 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 in complete agreement with you because we we have that multi capability of handling a lot more than we think we are and so when we when we close ourselves off and sort of like try to hide we start to see that oh my god i'm i'm, I'm not a, i i i i you you sense it right i'm not getting the quality that i i i need to and even for myself like i noticed this like for, for a long time i was you know listening reading watching talks and and having some conversations and and until and and i think until we had that conversation with you i had not been in a place whereby i noticed the whole you know the whole range of of capacity and and how to to sort of like engage with it and so through that it's like that one encounter sort of like uh, as bishop baron would say it rearranged my subjectivity and now here i am being a podcaster <laughs> and i'm finding like all the things i was worried about they're not there anymore it's like oh i i, I thought maybe i should just be writing about these things that are coming up when uh, i you know ingest this material but now i'm finding i'm having great conversation through which i learned so many new things and that gives me a lot of things to write about and i'm enjoying the writing i'm enjoying the conversations and now i have to learn how to produce this content and put it on there but it's 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 a uh, it's a work of passion like it's exciting to do this cuz like you know really listening to these talks even when i'm editing them it's like i'm still learning new stuff as i do that right like you know when when you when you're trying to find like what is the byte that i'm going to put like on instagram because it has to be like about 60 seconds what am i going to put in that and you're trying to find it and listen in that way it's like it's a different way but it also teaches you it's like there's so much to learn there's so much and over it's like a, a never ending endeavor and and so i'm so grateful <laughs> to you but i'm also really excited about this and so uh um, yeah I'll, i'll pass it back to you uh and and see what you have to share about that yeah well that was beautiful and i'm grateful for you and i think what you were saying just then um highlights a lot on this idea of an experience that rearranges you like bishop baron taught like the rearrangement of possibilities basically we need to think um of what would it look like to have education institutions or communities in which the possibility of people being rearranged was much higher and could occur um because that basically is the prerequisite for global pluralism not to turn into an uh, to regress to be a kind of disaster like a lot of people's lives are changed because they had an english teacher who said like the stories of english teachers who change everyone's lives is like through the roof right like so there are like like right now it kind of feels basically random dare i say on who is able to say do philosophy or do arts who has their potential rearranged they just happen to have a grandfather they just happen to do this coach and and there's always going to be some degree of randomness that is part of the picture but if there is a meaning crisis then there's a lack of um conditions of that are necessary for enough people more people on average to encounter experiences of rearrangement that would make them realize they're actually capable of just diving in to global pluralism not knowing the topic ahead of time and they can make it work right like because what you're talking about is you can always come up with reasons not to do something always uh there's always reasons not to do something 
The reason to do something is found in the doing. But that means you have to dive in. Um, a way to put it is I'm not sure. I doubt anyone has learned to swim who didn't jump in the water. Likewise, no one really learns how to be human or to be creative or being able to like work in the cipher who doesn't just dive into it. And I think what that gets into is how basically what humans need is not a point, but a situation. Like, because what's being described, like we were talking at the net of the other day of like, what's the point of philosophy, the point of the net or the point of these discussions. And there's something about the bravery it takes to do something pointless like you don't know the point, but it actually changes you as, as a subject to do something that may not have a point. I didn't say, you know, one of the things I was thinking about after that conversation is how it's actually, I think sometimes the fear of pointlessness is greater than the fear of death. Like I think it can sometimes be easier to face death than to face the possibility of pointlessness. Ironically, the fear of pointlessness results in the meaning crisis. Like the fear of not having meaning of doing something meaningless results in you never taking the plunge in which meaning is found. Uh, what you fear is what comes unto you. If you're afraid of doing something and doing a bad job or doing something that's pointless or doing something that's meaning, then that guarantees it. <laughs> you have to jump in. And funny enough, philosophy is pointless because philosophy is a situation. It's a way of life. Art is pointless because art is a situation. It's pointless because it's a higher geometry. It's not something with a point. It's a mode and way of being in the world. Many things that are pointless are actually situations. And you could say that the meaning crisis is a situation crisis, per se. It's a lack of situations in which people dive in to find their true selves, right? It's like the phrase, and Raymond makes this point, where when Socrates and all of them say, know thyself. Know thyself is a phrase of going to the gymnasium. You know yourself by finding out if you can climb a mountain. You don't know yourself by asking internal questions of what's going on. You know yourself when you do something hard, when you do something you're scared of, when you try to climb a mountain. So knowing yourself, the philosophical knowing yourself, the themos, as I was saying with Aspasia, is found in situation, not in point. Like, what's the point of your existence? Well, like, it's X, Y, and Z or whatever. It's like, well, they're, they're, I don't know. And if you find a point, the only way to find a point for the human being is reductionism. You have to reduce yourself to a single quality and say that's your point, right? But if you want to know yourself and it not be reductionist, then, it, then you must be a situation. Well, how do you be a situation? That means you have to throw yourself into something of which you will always have reason not to do. This is the key. Like if you want to have meaning, you have to face the reasons not to do something. So there's always a courage. Like Alex Ebert has said, the meaning of life is courage. I like that phrase. Because you literally have to just do it. And likewise, a good society will rearrange the possibilities where you see yourself as, yeah, I just need to do it. I just need to jump in and kind of take the dive, right? Because like, like to the point, very often people are like, how do I write more? Well, talking about writing might just be a point. The question is, how do I enter the situation in which writing just flows out of me? When you say, oh, I should do more philosophy. No, you need to find the situation in which philosophy just flows out of you. Or you just find yourself reading philosophy. You need to find the situation in which these things just happen. And that is entering into a proper space. That is entering into the creative unfolding. That's entering into relations and communities where you find yourself just doing these things because it just happens. You're like, oh, I guess I'm philosophizing now. Oh, I guess I'm writing. You just find yourself doing it. But you see, the problem is when people are like, I want to write more, they then tend to look for a point. What should I write? Well, the best writing is pointless. The best writing is situational in a weird way. Like, like if you ask, what is it? Let me, let me explain it this way. If you ask, what is the point of Hamlet? It's reductionist. The point of Hamlet is Hamlet. It is the entire situation of the book. It is the perpetual unfolding of many interpretations through history. It's a million points. Just like a room is not a point. A room is many points connected by relations that make geometrical space, right? So Hamlet is not the point. The moment you ask, what is the point of Hamlet? You're treating Hamlet like an equation versus a play. You've taken a situation and made it algebraic, right? So like another way to put it is, I think Walker Percy said, a novel is an emotion that could be expressed no other way, that there was no other language for. Like the language to describe the emotion was the entire novel, right? So a novel is a situation. It can't have a point without not being the novel. Now, of course, 
You can talk about points in so much as you bring them back to situations. You can reduce things to the price of being $200 as long as you don't forget that it's something more than the $200. But it, that is not easy for the brain to remember. The brain tends to reduce things and then forget that it reduced things and treats the thing that it's reduced to as the thing itself. That's the problem. The brain has a tendency to reduce and keep it reduced. And now it's not reduced. It just is a point. Well, now it's small. And, and you forget that it could have been something else. And that's kind of a spiritual blindness that occurs. That's, that's the spiritual blindness that you were saying of reductionism. It's that you reduce and then you forget it was never not reduced. And then you're blind. And now you're in a meaning crisis, right? So, the, yeah. and then because you get so used to everything being reduced, you're looking for points. What's the point of this? Because all you've ever experienced is the point, the gist. What's the price? Tell me what the topic is. All you ever do is experience things as points. And then you come into something like philosophy that doesn't have a point because it's a situation. And then when you don't find the point, you say, yep, it's a waste of time. And you go do something else in hopes of finding a meaning that was found in the thing you just walked past because it didn't have a point because it was a higher resolution. So it goes with novels. So it goes with being a human being. So it goes with fully living. But by definition, that means you find situations in the leaping into the situation of which you won't find a point to do until you do it. Because the point is the doing. It is the full unfolding of the way of life. But that means you dive in and then you're like, this is great. Yeah. It's like, but the door was shut until you opened it. You had to open it and jump in. But you could always find a reason not to open the door. You could say, well, it's locked. Well, have you tried the handle? No. Well, how do you know it's locked? Well, it has to be locked because otherwise it'd be opened. Try it. You know, C.S. Lewis said that hell was a, a room with a door locked from the inside. I think that goes for most of our lives. I think that's what we, we as human beings tend to do. We tend to put ourselves in rooms out of fear out of not wanting to be seen as wasting our time, as not wanting to be seen as doing something pointless, we as human beings reduce ourselves to a room that is locked from the inside. And then we never try the handle because we're like, what's the point? It's locked. Well, because it's not locked. Well, you don't know that. Well, why don't you know that? Because you haven't touched the handle. Why haven't you touched the handle? Because that would be pointless. And now you're stuck in a self-fulfilling prophecy, a self-justifying logic, that keeps you in that locked room. And one day you wonder why you've never left this room and why you, <clears throat> and why you never thought to leave. Well, because you never tried the handle. Well, why didn't you try the handle? Because there was always a good reason not to. And then life's over. Um, so I, I hand it back to you. Yeah, wow. Well, uh, so many good points in there. Um, the, the, you know, just the, the door that's locked within reminds me of um, the... You know the the, the shadows in uh, mm. in 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 Peter's cave, right? Uh. <laughs> Trapped by them, and and I think there's a lot you've touched on there, and I think the, the, the us telling ourselves, you know, the I telling myself, uh, giving myself all the reasons not to not to try it, not to participate. Um, yeah, it sounds like. And I guess that's where the, the Eastern traditions go. Like, you know, you have to kill the ego. I'm like, I don't know if you have to do that. <laughs> Maybe let's, uh, let's first understand this ego. Like, you know, what, what is it saying? What is it doing? How is, I would even say like, let's not, before we make first judgment on it, how about we have a conversation with this ego? Try to see what is it talking about, right? Uh, is it, is it being deceitful? Yes. Okay. It's telling me I can't open the door and I can't get out. But how do I really know? Because now if I, if I have a conversation, maybe to, to tell me all the ways, you know, all the historical data, it's messing off to make that prediction. Um, running all its assumptions about what it knows about this door, because this door really looks like all the other doors that I've seen in the past before, right? Yeah. So it definitely must be the same one. But it's missing that this is uh, a different instance of door, and we have to check each one of them. And and you know, like you said, the the brain is trying to compress; it doesn't really want to do anything, so it's going to try and persuade you uh, to not expend that that energy unnecessarily. You know, it's just trying to conserve energy; it's doing its role. But we have a role 
to deal with it. We have to engage with it and say, look, okay, great point, great idea, but we definitely have to investigate. Like we haven't investigated this dough. And back now with this ego to point us to the thing that we need to sort of like walk through. And I think that is a way that we can find ourselves participating more. And in the process, you know, then then maybe we, we uncover the evidence, right? Like we then can say, this is how I know. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll ask the children a lot about this, like, hey, dad, uh, this and this happened. And I think this and this is going to happen. It's like, yeah, but how do you know what's going to happen? Well, because this and this happened. And the last time it happened, that's how it turned out. Like, yeah, but that was last time, right? Like you are this old, it's several months ago. And Several people were around. It's a different set of people, different location, different day, different point in time. So do not undermine those details, right? They're, they're all valuable information that you have to consider. And I think in that process, then we can get away from, you'd say, the pointedness, the, our pointedness, trying to to be drawn to, you know, that way of, uh, a pointed way of being, if I may call it that way. Um, I was describing uh, this uh, thing about, you know, why did, why did God have to, you know, come down as Jesus and demonstrate? Uh, I, I, and I was, uh, I was using the, the example of the house. It's like, it's as though the house was given to us to live in. And we kept running into the walls, thinking those were, the walls were the point for us. Because you know, like, what makes a house? Well, the walls, right? But actually, Jesus comes in and goes like, no, 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 no. The space in between the walls, you know, the apophatic space, right? That is where life happens. And so his whole thing is going to show us how to walk through the house without bumping into the walls. and. And it's very similar. I think if we're being pointed, like all living in a pointed way, we're always going to be running into the walls. Uh, we will not appreciate, you know, that space in between. And I think it's in the space in between, like that in between space, that where we can now be allowed ourselves to experience the the phenomenology in a deeper way. Um, but also, it's a shared space, right? Like. While we're in there, the other people, you know, the the, the, the global pluralism, like the other people who are very different from us, uh, with different values, with different ethics, and different religious beliefs, that are also going to be sharing this space of experience. And so we have to be aware of that and be respectful of it, uh, but also be open to what is going to reveal itself to us. And I think the more we do that, the more we pay attention to what is open then that is how we get sucked into what must be happening, right? It's like the writing is in the writing, right? Like you don't learn dancing by watching it. You learn dancing by dancing. Uh, and so if you want to be a good runner, you actually have to go and run. Otherwise, you could read about running all you want, but it's going to be different. Like you're going to be a running philosopher who never runs. <laughs> or you could be a runner, right? You could just run and then you don't need to philosophize about running. And I think as a way to solve that, that you know, crisis, we definitely have to participate more. And I think that's what Vivek is talking about with the, the, the ways of knowing. It's like, you know, let's try and bring it down to the participatory way of knowing because then... It's embodied. Then it's in us. Uh, a lot of people think like the brain is just in the head, uh, but actually it's, it's in the body. It's everywhere. And so we have to train all the parts of the brain and allow them to actually know uh, our environment and our realities. And so, uh, yeah, so those are some of the thoughts that came up for me. I'll pass it back. Well, I mean, so a few things. One, if you did, if you don't have an ego, there would be nothing uh, for you to be courageous against, or nothing for you to challenge, right? You could remove the a ego, and it'd be the creation of a stable state. That's the problem. 
Likewise, you can have an ego seeking a stable state. So that's a problem, right? In order to have what I'll call the AB logic of a Hegel or, you know, where, which is reason versus understanding, you need a kind of contrast. You need difference. You need diversity in order to have unfolding, right? Like the reason why if you like a bookcase is parts and a whole and the holes are the parts and the parts of the whole and where do you locate it at? And there's a tension. There's a fundamental tension there where the parts are becoming the whole and the whole are becoming the parts and it's all circular in movement. It's this interrelation, interpenetration is the term you'll hear of Paggio or Verveke talk about in different things. So the bookcase is not actually stable. It's only stable in so much as you don't ask questions about it. Once you ask, well, where is the bookcase? Uh, it's in the glass and now it's the sip of thesis, right? Like you take it apart and it falls apart. It's not stable anymore, right? So everything around you has the potential to not be stable if you question it. Uh, and so, you know, pluralism, globalism came along and now we question our beliefs. So nothing is stable. But the temptation is then to return to stability in the form of nationality, closed minded, to go back and regress. It's like, I want it stable again. So let me just get rid of the ego. Well, let me just say everyone's stupid but me. Let me just find my tribe. So there's a desire to go back to the stability when the loss of stability is the invitation for the phenomenology of the artist. No, no, no. You've lost. Losing stability does not mean you're doomed. You now might be able to fly. You've been pushed out of the nest. Okay, let's go. And like global pluralism is basically being pushed out. You're being, humanity is giving the invitation to fly. Uh, but it's scary. So we'd rather go back to the nest. But if you go back to the nest, that's a problem. Uh, that's regressing et cetera, so forth. So you push down, you've got to fly. Um, the only way to fly in this sense seems to be the coordination of many parts. Like you've said about wisdom with a bicycle, you know, wisdom is the taking of the many into the one. That is wisdom. And I think we could think of the four Ps of Verveki as wisdom would be the coordination of the four Ps, right? Of figuring out how to indeed do it. And that coordination is exactly the coordination of global pluralism. It is the coordination of the artistic act. It is the coordination of the phenomenon of the artist so that you get a creative product. So you get a relationship so that you get a friendship so that you get an emergence because in a conversation, you're coordinating the many to the one, right? Multiple people, mm -hmm. one topic, there's a court. So basically every conversation that is dialogical is actually wisdom expressed. There is an expression of wisdom in that very dialogue, if it's taking on not the phenomenology of the business transaction, but the phenomenology of the artist. And if global pluralism is not going to kill us all, what would that be? A coordination of the many into the one, right? Like global pluralism would only succeed if it somehow manifests wisdom. And I think wisdom has to be some sort of coordination of the metaphysical, because if it wasn't, then it would just be a coordination of the physical. Now, metaphysical includes the physical, so I'm not saying it's abstraction, but it's like technical knowledge is not wisdom because it's just like how to put the engine together, right? Like technical mm. knowledge is just facticity. So if wisdom is distinct from technical knowledge, it has to be the coordinating of something that is not reducible to facticity, right? Well, then it's a coordination of relation. It's a coordination of the many into the one. It's a coordination of these abstract social forms that are arts, abstract social, abstract social arts, these coordination of things that people share that are invisible, like a relation. Where's the relation at? It's here. Where? Here, somehow, somewhere. And wisdom is a coordination of that thing that is very real. It would be ridiculous to say the relation is an illusion. And yet it would also be ridiculous to say the relation itself is the same as a cup. They are somehow different, right? And wisdom is the coordination of that metaphysical that metaphysics, that relation to make possible a harmony, to make possible the one. And I think killing the ego, well, if everyone kill the ego is what kind of is needed for difference in a way, like ego is what makes differentiation. The problem is when the ego dominates. It's when ego, ego differentiates and then isolates. That's the problem. So you go ego, differentiates, and then it isolates or it's better than everyone else, pride or different things, right? So... So then you say, well, let's get rid of the ego. Well, if you do that, you don't have differentiation and you probably don't have relations very much uh, because you're a stable state and you have to make, so you go off and become a monk or a monastery and, and stuff like that. And that's a strategy, uh, but that's the isolationist strategy to the problem of global uh, pluralism, which a lot of people are doing, but um, that would not uh, be the proper address. Uh, that, 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 would be, that would be running from global pluralism more than facing it, in my opinion. Um, and so it becomes a question of how to deal with the metaphysical. And that seems to be wisdom. That seems to be the artist. And that's, you know, another thing, basically, 
I'm almost at the point of saying wisdom is friendship. Like when we say the love of wisdom, like wisdom is friendship because friendship versus like a legal contract marriage or an association, like friendship is like pure end in itself. Like, right? Like we say that all the time, like friendship is an end of itself. It's pointless. Of course it is because it's a situation. And so wisdom is the knowledge. Wisdom seems to be something like the knowing how to coordinate a friendship. It seems to be knowing how to coordinate relations, knowing how to create spaces, to create situations. It's like, and if that's the case, then philosophy is the love of friendship. And philosophy is knowing how to be a friend and knowing how. And, and it certainly seems to be the case if we're talking about friends who are different. Like if we're talking friends, but the problem is like if it's friends, then it's just tribesmen. Like if you all share the worldview, you can like, you can be nice to one another. You can be friendly. But like, is it like this deep friendship? Um, that seems to require, let's put it this way. To the degree that the friendship is across difference, otherness, true otherness, which has something to do with love, then it's going to require more and more wisdom. And if it's going to require more and more wisdom, it's going to require more and more philosophy, which is the love of the skills that make possible friendship. And really, at the end of the day, uh, you know, global pluralism would need friendship, not law, not, you know, ability, ability to see, like, people as an end in them, of themselves, right? Well, that would mean people, the, the thing is, I, you know, when we say that human, I'll give it back to you. When we say that humans are an end in themselves, then we're saying they're pointless. But you see, that language is too negative. That's why I keep saying situation. Like if we say we do things because it's good to do pointless things or Julian Bendel will say that college exists to defend the useless things like the humanities or literature or different things. The problem is that language is so negative that it's hard to associate it with virtue or to associate well, if you're like, well, if it's useless, when you're under the hegemony of utilitarianism and someone tells you that philosophy is useless, it's hard to then do it. But if I say to you that philosophy is useless because it's a situation, it's a way of being. It's actually high. It's pointless because it's higher than points. Friendship is pointless because it's higher than points. It is a situation and you must live in a situation because you are alive. So which one you want to live in? You want to live in a quality situation or not? You know, well, I would like to be in a quality situation. Well, then you're going to do, you're going to need to do things that are situational then. That means they're pointless because they're situational. Well, now, okay, this is a positive language now. All right. So college exists for Julia Benda to teach people how to live in situations. That's why it's about, and situations are useless. You can't, you can't use a room for something like as a whole, you can't pick it up. A room is a space you enter in which usable things are situated, but the room itself is the condition of possibility for use and is not useful itself. Philosophy is the condition of possibilities in which useful things can be situated, but in of itself, it's not useful because it is what makes use possible. So it goes mm. with friendship. So it is goes with being a human being. And so it also then determines the type of use that matters to you. Like if friendship is the horizon of possibility according to which you define utility, then your idea of utility is very different from someone who doesn't have friendship as the means by which they define utility. Suddenly philosophy is very, this is the issue. Like people who do philosophy for friendship, they'll say philosophy is useful. Well, how? Because it is defining use within terms of friendship. Like it upgrades utility. This is the problem. Like without philosophy, friendship, people are stuck in a low resolution understanding of utility. They're stuck in a kind of low algebraic form of what is use. But when you start talking about situations, then things can be useful that make possible situations like art, like philosophy, like, like friendship. And basically without that higher order understanding of utility, uh, which would get into like virtue ethics, values and different things like that, there is no possibility, no possibility of creating a global pluralism that is able to ask questions about how do we belong together that is not reductionistic. You need the situational thinking in order to create the situation in which those people can get along and exist to differ. And in fact, cherish difference, not be afraid of it, but be glad for it because that very difference is why the friendship can be more generative. The very diversity is why it becomes more creative. Just like, like there's creativity as a result very often of a kind of tension. There are these different things the artist is holding together to then generate something, right? 
So then difference becomes precisely the condition of the possibility of creativity that you can handle because you have trained yourself in the situation of friendship that sees that difference as a wonderful thing and is happy for it. And so that global pluralism switches from being a problem that's going to get us all killed into a situation that generates creativity. And now we have a different logic of human operation that is not just business logic, but creative logic. Yeah, and, and uh, wisdom is going to be what allows us to play in that space of possibility. And yes. yeah, you know, if a friend was asking me over the weekend that, you know, had I, do I not have wisdom? And, uh, and I was articulating, like, look, I don't, I don't think that's the, a good way to look at it, like having, as a having mentality. It's like, I think you can be wise, you can behave in a wise way, and it's going to, it's going to really reveal to you the possibilities of the situation as you articulated there. And I think I really love that, that idea as a, the room is a, a potential for possibility, and, but it's still up to you to come in and unlock that, that potential because uh, it, the room can only be as useful as you make it. If you, if you, if you don't make it useful enough, then it will sit there. You know, you, you, you hear people talk about all these books on bookshelves gathering dust and cobwebs. And yeah, the, it, that's the evidence. They're not, they're not actually being interacted with. Does, does that mean that they don't have uh, things in there? They do have lots of uh, knowledge to share. But until the book is picked up and read, uh, then it is just a potential sitting on a shelf. Um, so I think all as we try to solve the the global pluralism i do feel like we have to start doing that wise creativity and you know which is which is art and it's a, it's a, it's all going to be like an art form thank you daniel it's always a pleasure to have you and i look forward to our future conversation